titty jesus motherfuckers we're back with another episode of world one one podcast uh as usual before we get into the good stuff all the places you can and should find us uh at our home at world one one dot podbean dot com all spelled out all one word uh for your audio fixings you can also pick us up at uh apple podcast google play music uh spotify and iheart radio uh if you need to inject us directly into your eyeballs you can uh, pick us up uh, as we record live right the hell now on our Twitch channel and uh, catch the rerun on our uh, spiffy little YouTube channel um, to keep up on all the news and updates. Uh, of course, uh, Facebook and Twitter are the places to find us. Uh, now, with all that bullshit out the way, let's get to the fun shit. As always, choose your fighter. I am your host, Larry the Bearded Wonder. Joining me tonight, Eddie Blackman V. Can we get a Space Harrier remake? No, absolutely not. <laughs> we need one. <laughs> Designed Kathy, by treasure. <laughs> Kathy, Lord of the Stream. Hello, everyone. Josh the Legru. Hello. Dylan Drinky Pants. Yup. And we are joined by very, very special guests tonight. Uh, super excited to have Matt Motherfucking Bittner. Hi. I'm a developer for a robot named Fight super super pumped um if you guys have been listening to us for the last uh, few uh episodes you'll know that i especially have been digging into robot name fight i reached out to matt and matt was kind enough to say yes uh blindly uh, volunteering himself for our uh three ring circus of insanity <laughs> so kathy's already tired of my bullshit <laughs> <laughs> just started kathy ah <laughs> uh, so, um, let's jump in. So we're going to chuck the usual format out the window. We're just going all in tonight. Um, Matt, I, I want to kind of turn it over to you to start with. Tell, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and how did you get to a robot named Fight? Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm Matt. Um, for a long time, I worked at a Petco. Um, I got an English degree uh, at, at the college in the city where I was born. Like, uh, no no real education or background or anything like that. Um, but then eventually uh, taught myself, like, Action Script 3 programming, doing Flash. So I started making games, making Flash games. Um, and then from there, I ended up getting a job making games for a mobile game company called HitSense. Um, we put out a game called Draw Stickman Epic. There's another one called Battle Pillars, but that's kind of where I like learn to program, learn Unity development and everything like that. And after being there for four or five years, um, my like grandmother passed away and I ended up leaving that job. And that's when I started a robot named Fight, which uh, I worked on for like about a year and then put out and got, it was released in 2016, uh, September. And I started on it the year before that, I think. Or did it come out in 17? Maybe it came out in 2017, I don't know how old. <laughs> <laughs> It's been a minute, yeah. And I started on 2016, but yeah, that's, that's that's the gist of it. It's a short right. version. Right on. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but for the most part, Robot Name Fight was pretty much just a, a one-man crew game. It was just you, correct? Yeah, yeah. It was it was pretty much entirely me. My wife helped with social media marketing and some of the publishing stuff when we launched the game. Um, I hired a PR company, Novi, to like help market it and stuff, and I had a a friend that I worked with at HitSense do some of the promotional art and everything, but as far as what you see in the actual game, that's that's all me. Sound and music. Graphics, right programming, etc. 
that's that's a whole lot to take in under uh, under one umbrella or just to one person to be able to do everything fully rounded out. Um, that's that's impressive as all get out. I say I can only think of uh, we we've had one other person on a few years back that kind of uh, did that same mass undertaking as a one man show, and so I, I I marvel at anybody that can pull all that yeah. off by themselves. So, um, I'm, I'm dying to know here, part of this is super obvious, or at least I would fathom so, some of the influence for you for a robot named Fight, you know, there, there's one game that kind of stands out as a very obvious influence, (laughs) but... I'm, Are you talking about Zombie Ate My Neighbors again? Absolutely. <laughs> that's the one. How'd you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm curious what some of the others are that have snuck in and, uh, you know, maybe more subtly that aren't as uh, immediately noticeable. Yeah, well, I mean, the, like, the game itself is, like, largely influenced by, like, Binding of Isaac and Super Metroid. Like okay. you play either of those games, you play you play Robot Name Fight, you're gonna see those games influence pretty strongly. Um, but otherwise, like Contra, Mega Man X, like a lot of classic Super Nintendo shooters. Like I tried to run the gamut and look at a lot of stuff and like put little homages to different old games that I used to play, like back in the early nineties. Um like, Turri- like, uh, Super Turrican. Yeah, well, I've never played Super Turrican, but everybody... Really? Yeah, everybody <laughs> says, like, yo, your game looks dead up like Super Turrican. And I've watched it since then and been like, yeah, I guess you're right. Like, it does, but um, I actually haven't played Super Turrican. Um, a handful of old Turbo Graphics games, uh, Alien Crush, and then, like, I don't know, weird movies, John Carpenter's The Thing, uh, David Cronenberg films, stuff like that. Okay. Now, have you started working on anything else, or are you just kind of resting on your laurels with Zombie Name Fight? <laughs> I'm working on uh, a handful of things right now. Uh, I'm working on a pinball game. Okay. <gasps> which right. I think is kind of public. Um, but uh, that just started. We'll see where it goes. And then um, it's, been, it's been kind of a research period like i've been working on some machine learning stuff and i've been working with blender like trying to teach myself a lot of 3d model and like learning a bunch of different new little skills and trying to piece stuff together uh work with some rpg stuff for a bit so nice. yeah just trying to figure out where to go next with some of that and then i'm still working on a robot name fight like that's the big thing with it is i'm always but not always doing something with it yeah, yeah. now now you being an english major and writing and everything how did you come about the story for writing this game Man, I've had that forever. Um, it's very much like an inversion of the classic um, robots take over humanity, um, and the humanity has to fight against the robots. It's the uh, robots have to defend themselves against meat from space. Um, but then, in in messing with that, I wanted to play with like some ideas around deep time and history. And like, we played the game, you know, kind of later on, you learn the origins of the Mega Beast and kind of where all that comes from, so... Ooh, um, I haven't you... gotten to that yet. Oh, you haven't gotten to that? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. it's still thoroughly kicking my ass, trust me. <laughs> Did you... Uh, uh, <laughs> it, it, I think, like, Terminator 2 is a good touchstone for, like, I don't know. The Did story you ever... of even Mega Man X, I guess. Did you ever think about, you know, starting off from a B-movie perspective, or are you just like, you know, this is kind of a not cliche sci-fi kind of thing but like this is a starter point and then i can expand from there well yeah definitely like uh old old like melt films and like 80s horror stuff like the stuff or ghoulies mm-hmm. or like that kind of like campy 80s horror that that definitely was an influence i'd say and like the the, the game um i tried to make it in flash like 10 years ago right so there's this version out there called my robot is fight uh, that you can maybe find on Congregate. It's really crappy, I'm ashamed of it. But it was all uh, in like broken English and like it was it was intended to be very like, I don't know, um, you have no chance to survive, make your time, all your bases belong, are belong to us, kinda. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, go, ahead. Yeah, go ahead, you. 
Oh, so um, I, I can do this all night. If you guys don't jump in, I will totally fucking steamroll this. So, so uh, I I kind of hinted a question at you earlier, and there's a game called Castle that's out that has kind of the same same okay. idea of a Metroid uh, rogue like um, style game. Um, what are your thoughts of this now? This now becoming the thing because roguelike games are not really discussed among a lot of people, and mixing them in this Metroidvania style genre of games is kind of like slowly coming about, but it's not really there yet. Um, what 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 is your thoughts about it? Like when yeah. you when you look at Chasm, did you look at your game? Um. Chasm did a lot of things differently. Like Chasm, for one, I don't know if you could call it like a true roguelike. It doesn't have permadeath. Like mm-hmm. it's just kind of a randomly generated Metroidvania that you start out and you play all the way through. Um, I had the idea for a robot named Fight back in I don't know. It was a while back, and, and as soon as I started on, I looked up other games that were doing it, and it was like, okay, Chasm's the big one. That's the that's the other game that's going to come out that I have to worry about it. But really what blindsided me is, like, before A Robot Named Fight came out, Dead Cells jumped on the um, Steam shop in Early Access or whatever, and it was like the other Roguevania. Um, and it did things very different. I, I, I'd argue it's, it's more Vania than Metroid, and mine's very, yeah. very Metroid. But um, I'm glad the genre exists, and I'm hoping, like, several games are coming out and everybody's trying different things with how to achieve like this idea of an infinitely replayable Metroid. Um, so hopefully hopefully that continues and people are able to like improve it. Like I don't think I nailed it with a robot named Fight by any means. I think, you know. Sure, I I'm kind of feeling things. like you did. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. There's still, I still, uh, I've rewritten the map generation, well, once entirely in development, and then since the game's launch, like the most recent patch in the sewers, I pretty much rewrote how maps are laid out in, in big broad ways. So I think there's still a lot of work that can be done to like intelligently create this random Metroidvania feel. Like it, there's a lot of stuff to consider. I don't know. If there was like one thing you could go back and like do better or again in the game, what would it be? Oh man, that changes daily. (laughs) (laughs) I I look at it now and I just see mistakes, of course. So like, um, I think, I think a big one would be like the, the boss fights could be improved. Like, especially I just got through, we were talking about this before the podcast, but like Blazing Chrome came out and it has all these amazing cinegraphics, like, uh, cinematographic boss fights and, and like very memorable moments and the, the bosses in Aurora fight, a lot of them are kind of pushovers. They're, they're close to those Isaac style bosses that have three four moves and things like that. So I've been trying since release to add more compelling like bosses or more memorable moments. I think uh-huh. like the game from moment to moment feels real good, but I'd like there to be more like Oh yeah, that really stands out, and I don't know how that fit into a random something like along the lines of like what Hollow Knight does, or more like uh, another game closer to that category. Maybe kind of like Hollow Knight. Hollow Knight has some really good boss design, and I think it had some really like oh, I wandered in this area and I recognize that it's very like breathtaking that kind of thing. I think you should take a look at a game called Iconoclast. Iconoclast, I've heard of. Yes, oh, and that was a game developed by one person. Also, it took him seven years to make it. If you're looking for like kind of story and bosses, really take a look at that one because not only deal it, does it deal with like religion, with the story and everything, it has some of the most creative sprites and boss fights, um, like really well done. Um, and so I think yeah, take a look at it, like look at the video and everything or any or something. I, I think you might be surprised about. That. Probably just game. Up. <laughs> I've been meaning to for a minute. There's just so many games. Iconoclast is definitely good, but as Metroidvanias go, it is extremely talky, story heavy. Which Whoa. is which is not something you get a lot of. Uh, don't give me the story's good, mm-hmm. but uh, by comparison to most Metroidvania games, you don't usually get get them that that story heavy and narrative 
heavy. Right. Shoot. So, if, if you noticed in a robot named Fight, I'm not a big story guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. A, I, I don't like a lot of reading. <laughs> well, I think but, I think that I think like stories in games when there's when there's a balance of reading and writing um, in the in the game, it kind of gives you more um, meaning to actually fulfill the quest that's in that game. Um, and I know a lot of Metroidvania style games, they really want people just to go in and just play. And if you want to find it, you can. But I think sometimes if you, if you not say effort, but if you just put something there, that's going to feel like immersive to the player. I think they they appreciate it a little bit more. Of, uh, about it because they'll be like oh this is a cool story that I didn't know and I'm finding different parts of yeah. so like tidbits of lore is that what you're saying Eddie? in a way in a way because like Metroid Prime how, how Metro Prime was like how it told the story if you explore throughout the world and scan stuff you got more of an understanding and it felt like the adventure um the adventure was more satisfying because you're learning about this planet and these enemies and stuff like that I did like that in, Metro, in the Metroid Prime series because it wasn't like in your face about it. Like you had the option of doing it, and if you wanted mm-hmm. to do it, you could, you could go do it. You could look up it. You could scan everything in the world, read all about it. Um, even Doom, the new Doom 2016, which has you know, it's very light on story. I mean, it's there, but yeah. like it has that like log where you can go back. God, I love that game. It's yeah. just pure it's, um, amazing adrenaline. Punching fucking demons in the face. Oh, I love it. Uh, fucking fools. The only problem with Doom, though, is that some of the fights are too long. And it's just like, carry this thing up. This is too going for too long. I feel like they, they drag some of the fights a little bit. I, I, I don't know, man. That game is very well paced, like, for what it is. It's just constant action. Like, it's just, oh, I don't know. I, yeah, it's, but then we the soundtrack. Need- <laughs> when you soundtrack need, of that soundtrack game. Soundtrack is good. Just, wow. But when you need the right ammo and they don't give it to you, you be like, dang! <laughs> like, they put the pressure on you sometimes. You're just like, dang it. The, the very last level in 2016, like, it's an endurance test just to yeah. go through those fights in a row because it's just nonstop, like, lockdown. Yeah. If you could do, like, a, another genre of game, what, what do you think you would do? Um... Man, I'm really I interested. Oh, go ahead. Um, I guess uh, you would do something like Snatch. Like what? Um, Snatcher. I've never played Snatcher. I don't know. Oh, Snatcher was a game that Hideo Kojima made. It was like an F- FMV um, uh, adventure game where oh. the people, where the people on the land, on the planet, some of them were uh, cyborgs. You had to kind of figure out who was a cyborg or not. That's kind of cool. Yeah, um, the Turbo Graphics, yeah, the Turbo Graphics 16 that's coming to America, they're going to have Snatcher on it, and that's the first, that's the second release that in America it had because it was on the Sega CD, and not not a lot of people played it. Man, I'm definitely getting that. One of the old games, like I love the Turbo Graphics 16. One of the old games I played on all the time was a, was a game called Final Lap Twin. Has anybody heard of yeah. Final Lap Twin? Yep, I have. It's like, it's like a racing RPG game. Yes. Where you like yes. go from town to town or whatever. I've always wanted to like revisit that concept. Don't leave like a different style of racing, like not that kind of Mario Kart style racing, but like I don't know. That's been in the the uh, backlog for a bit. I've played around with that concept a little bit. And then, so I'm, I'm curious. So it's all these weird genre mixtures. It's like stuff that shouldn't fit together. I'm curious to that end. Then um, you know, not not necessarily the Mario Kart style of racing, but. Uh, what what would you uh, what what kind of spin would you put to it? Um, well, I don't know. I don't know how much I want to reveal there, but there was a. a I won't say anything directly to that, but I will say some racing games I really love. Uh, Super Nintendo had like a stunt racing game called Uniracers. Yeah, yes. that I really, really, really love, and I'd I'd love to see that concept take a little further. One okay. of Miyamoto's uh, unknown games that a lot of people. Kind oh, of so got obsessed with it. Actually, yes. uh, kind of oddball-ish racing game that Kathy and I have been playing off and on for the last couple months uh, on Switch. Uh, the next Penelope might be one to uh, take the a peek Penelope. at. Right on. So, 
Uh, so you'd like to get into racing games if if you weren't doing the Metroidvania types? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They're pretty cool. Uh, racing RPGs. That's an idea. Uh, that would be I, awesome. I could get behind that. You know I mean... who had that? Grid. Grid had an RPG-esque uh, thing to it where, like, you developed your drivers and your team but... over the course of, like, you know, months and years or whatever. And, you know, uh, making your teammates better and, you know, coercion and all that. It was... That game was awesome. It was my favorite racing game. Number two was garbage, though. Don't play it. It's, it's kind of <laughs> it like... took all the good stuff out. It's kind of like Forza Horizon 4. Like the Horizon series from Forza that they're almost like a mix of racing and RPGs um, in it. Um, that you go up different levels and stuff, but you do different races to get there. And sometimes you can just drive around the world, be destructive, and still raise up your level. Yeah, it's kind of cool. So I'm I'm curious here, um, just because the it fascinates me because it gives me infinite things to play, and that makes me utterly thrilled. Um, I'm curious to hear, you know, what goes into making. Uh, an engine that can basically randomly generate a cohesive functional map for something like a Metroidvania on repeat like that, like what you you've got here with the uh, robot. Man, so that was that was the task, right? Like everything else in the game, I could fathom. Kind of kind of been done before. Like people have made platformers, people have made shooters. You know, like a lot of that is well tread territory. But like making a particular Metroidvania, like. Um, I tried several different things. Like, there's a lot of random generation algorithms out there, but they're all designed around, like, they're a little too random, right? So there's no way to have that intended item route and that kind of, like, lock and key flow that Metroidvanias have. So the first thing was, like, looking at existing Metroidvanias, namely Super Metroid and everything from the Metroid series, uh, Symphony of the Night, going through and, like, trying to classify and categorize the different kinds of paths, if that makes any sense. So, mm -hmm. um, like, you know, there's, like, blocks you can slide under, or there's passageways where you can slide. There are, like, doors that are blocked off, and then there are rooms where you have, like, one section of a room blocked off from another section of a room. Um, there are one-way passages, and there are, um, like, long drops that you can't get back up of. So, starting from a standpoint of being able to hand design content, all the rooms in a robot named Fight are hand designed with all these different permutations for uh, to account for different like traversal abilities or whatever. And then mm -hmm. the map is generated after uh, an intended item out of order is kind of conceived of. So it'll go in and it'll look at like the, at, at this point, I think like 20 to 30, I don't know exactly how many items are traversal items like items that help you get past obstacles, but it'll pick seven of those, put them in an intended order, usually with like a final one that gives you kind of a flight capability. And then it'll use that order to create the map, if that makes any sense, so. Right. Okay. And um, it, oh, go ahead. No, shoot. <laughs> uh, no, I was just gonna say, um, yeah, it uses, it uses like some pathfinding and some like really basic old stuff like that to be able to create those to route through previously tread areas and there's a couple tricks and a handful of things but it's largely like i don't know it's like branches and spokes off those branches and then loops those are the kind of structures that it uses to put stuff together right on very cool yeah. so uh, on the note of random i'm i'm curious here because i've I, I will freely admit i've poked around a little bit online just kind of looking at some faqs out of sheer curiosity um at what's out there in in robot that i haven't gotten to yet but one that i haven't found and it may exist and i just haven't looked hard enough the um why am i drawing a blank uh, yeah we can call them shrines i suppose the the random little uh gods that let you donate your scrap yeah i'm i'm dying to know here is the outcome of what they do 100% random luck of the draw when you're donating your scrap in or are there specific triggers there are there's uh, 
lot of different formulas that can help determine, like you can get reliable results from those things. There are, there are recipes you can give them to get specific items, which, okay. or, or rather like there are item pools and you can kind of game those pools knowing what you're doing. There's a big hint as to what works if you're, if you go to one of those shrines and you look at their UI um, up in the, up in the top left, that's all I'll say. But there's kind of a big hint as to how to use them. They're, they're an element of the game that I, I may need to, I don't know, revisit at some point. It confuses a lot of people. And then once people figure it out, they're like, oh, I can wreck this game. I don't know. I, I like the confu I was just kind of curious how fully random it was or was not. You know? Um, yeah. Basically, that, that if you give them something specific, they'll kind of pick a random amount. Like, the more you give them, the better the results. So if you give them a bunch of your good scrap or 99 scrap or whatever, like, you'll usually get something good. But. Right. Okay. Um, I, I got to... I, I, I kind of want to hear from the source on this because this has been one of my favorite fucking parts of this game. The tutorial smith <laughs> fucking kills me every... I shit you not, dude. Every time I get to the tutorial smith and I see something new, I screen cap it on my Switch to go back and laugh at it again later. Um, but what what boggled me, especially the first time, I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Is when he fucking cursed me. And I'm like... <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm curious what made you pull the trigger to let the tutorial smith be a random dick. I don't know. It just seemed uh, appropriate for a roguelike. Like, it, it um, you, you've not invested too much at the start of the run. Some of the negative effects are a little, a little uh, harsh. I will say that. Like, you start a run and you get, like, damage down or whatever. That's no fun. Uh, but you can quickly restart. If you're playing on Steam, by the way, you can do a uh, shift R to like rapidly restart, kind of like Isaac. Um, okay. But it was also to kind of like scare people away, like people that don't want bad things, they, they won't mess with them. But then people that are more adventurous are a little bit like, this is, what's going on here? This doesn't make any sense. Give them something to explore. And it does, there are big rewards associated with that tutorial bot. Okay. The so, risk and reward saw, system. Yeah. I saw a lot of uh, people when they were reviewing the game, that was their biggest issue was what a dick that guy was. I love the tutorial Smith. <laughs> so I found I found that really interesting, but like oh, and, said, and, yeah, and the other part of it is I like I do want you to have an antagonistic relationship with that character for specific reasons that Right. Come clear later, but yeah, no, it was just funny because that was like the biggest complaint yeah. I saw Everybody when people reviewing. <laughs> it's like, damn it! <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I gotta say, for for somebody that you know isn't particularly nuts about you know dialogue and story in their in their game and their Metroidvania, the the little bits of dialogue that are in Robot fucking kill me. I absolutely adore. It's like, we must fight the storm of meat with all the guns. I can make all the guns. Yes! <laughs> the, yes. The, the snippets that are there are pure gold. Like, I I, I just want more of it. Yeah, so. I definitely need to add a little more of it. It's going up. So. I'm glad. I'm glad y'all dig it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I know you kind of mentioned that Dead Cells kind of got in, at least on early access, about the same time you did. Um, one of the things that came later for Dead Cells, at least in terms of uh, Steam, was uh, some Twitch integration where Twitch viewers can actually, you know, kind of interact with and either help or uh, dick with the person playing. Um, would you consider, or is that an idea that you've toyed with? And if so, how do you think something like that might play into Robot Name Fight, given that there there is a drastic, you know, difference between the two? Don't get me wrong, they technically fall into the same new fusion genre, but, you know, one definitely swings way one side and way the other. Yeah, they're very, they're very different games, but... Man, as far as Twitch integration goes, I don't know. I'd have to just look at it. 
Like, I'd love to do things like that, but when you get into, like, online features or features that require, like, internet connection or anything like that, mm-hmm. like, there's a bunch of considerations that start coming into play for, like, live ops or managing things. I mean, not that you necessarily have to run live ops for having Twitch integration, but um, it seems like a lot of work. <laughs> like, like I, I would imagine I'm so. To be completely honest, like for me alone, it seems like a big thing. Uh, it's probably not. It's probably not terrible to do. Um, but I want to get it on Discord next. Like, the things that would take priority over something like that would be like getting it on Discord. Uh, like, an online leaderboard would be nice. Just something where like people can, or daily runs. So before before adding like Twitch or Parsec support or anything like that, I have to. Have to get better at net programming, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, what did you think about speed running in your game? Because you put that as an option. Uh, yeah, for... that timer's front and center. Oh okay. yeah. Um, I speed run Super Metroid. Uh, I'm not good at it. Uh, I think I'm like 537th on Deer tier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so like my my in game time is uh, like 56 minutes or something. So it's not good. It's not great, especially compared to the people who just wreck that game. But I really like the experience of speedrunning and like sequence breaking is super fun. So I want to like work towards making that more of a part of Robot Knight Fight. Right now, it has to be a little rigid with how much sequence breaking it allows you to do, simply because you can get soft locks because the map's completely random. Like you can't plan for every contingency. But right. I've been trying to sneak in things that let you do that a little better. Uh, do you think uh, little traver- traversal steps like wall running and like wall jumping and stuff? Um, do you think that might come into uh, a robot name fight? I would like to add some like uh, extended move set stuff, some like hidden extended move set stuff to the game. Uh, some some's already there, um, and a handful of people in Discord know about it. But um, I think more of that would be good. That's probably would coming you, some updates would you like to share some of that with our audience of about five people that listen to this yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so wall jumping wall jumping's not in there right now because uh, i knew the game was very similar to super metroid i didn't want to take lots of stuff from super metroid so wall jumping was something i left out um i think i might add that in relatively i, I think your wall jump. Jump, i think your wall jumping would be more effective than super metroid Super Metroid's wall jumping is kind of difficult to pull off. Oh no, if I had it, it'd be real difficult to pull off. <laughs> I love like, it. like once you know how to do it, it feels awesome. But because like Super Super Metroid's wall jumping is considered or compared to, in my opinion, to Strider's wall jump on the NES. That okay. it don't all re- it, it don't when you are pressing the right um, directions, it don't always respawns at all. For yeah. it. So it would be kind of interesting. Time. You got that frame where Sam is spaced against the wall, but mm-hmm. I think, I don't know. I think that would allow, right now, the one place in the game where you can get stuck is if you, like, uh, there's a jump path, right? And it's yeah. effectively one way. That's how you describe it, is you have to jump up to get somewhere. If you manage to sequence break and later fall down that path without the right jumping capability, you're stuck down there. There's really no way up. Every other kind of gating mechanism in the game is is two way or something where you can um, you can get around it. If you can get around it one way, you can get around it the other way. But having wall jumping in there would eliminate soft locks from like falling in deep pits and not being able to to get back up for the most part. That's why I'm thinking wall jumping might need to be in there. What about wall running? Like running up a wall? Oh, running up a wall? That'd have to be like its own item, I think. You don't want people to run directly to the Mega Beast. I'm really good. But wall running would be fun. I like um, weird little techniques. Right now, there's slide jumping. You know how you can get slide? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can time it to where you can maintain your velocity from that slide um, with a jump and like get over certain barriers that you otherwise couldn't. So there's weird stuff like that. There's dash jumping. There's a handful of things. People have figured out how to clip through walls with the arachnomorph. The right now the speedrun record for a robot in fight I think was like three minutes. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, that's, 
I'll never be Holy doing that. Balls. <laughs> wow. You do you got you have to know the game inside out or cheat? I, I would say. You for that to cheat. I mean, that's what it really is. is you got to get that perfect run where you can like, here's the right. sequence. Where I can go straight for the Mega Beast. Wow. So, um, it, it, Quick, uh, before, I before, I know what it was. Before you Eddie, go, Larry, you got it. Go. Um, would you or uh, would you add like a super turbo mode to it? What's a super turbo mode? <laughs> like, like, okay. When the game That's is a specific out, mode like, that exists like, in Eddie's like, head. See, it's like not the, just us, Eddie. Like, just the us. Game. <laughs> <laughs> like, like a hard mode or like a new game plus kind of thing? Uh, well, in a way, like a challenge where it's the game is faster, but you know, you like every time you hit a you hit an enemy, a little bar at the bottom grows. But if you get hit, you lose your whole bar or it goes down. And so when your bar is full, you pull off a super move and can attack enemies like that and keep going. But the game is faster instead of the regular speed it is. Almost like, of course, it's Super Street Fighter 2. Okay, uh, I got you. And, 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 and that's what, Super Street Fighter. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But the, but the I, turbo... I mean, something like that could maybe be fun. Uh, I don't know. I've been playing around with, like, secret seeds. Something like that would maybe be a good secret seed where, like, you enter a certain scene, the game's twice as fast, or it's twice as slow. Uh, in the cool one stories, I just introduced like the ice areas or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, secret scene where everything's slippery, stuff like that would be really fun. Okay. Um, I was gonna ask, what uh, what made you decide to go the route you did with uh, some of the items in terms of like abilities, where you know, instead of there. Are, only being certain things that are energy weapons and certain things, you know, only being modifications to your your base weapon. You know, what what made you to opt to kind of go, okay, we can we can add a, a fire tweak to either or and make them drastically different still. Cause you you it feels like you definitively went the extra mile on that rather than just kind of you know, skating out, going. This is the one fire thing, or this is the one electricity thing. Yeah, it honestly like uh, it was a practical decision because all, like I said, all the rooms are hand designed, right? And mm -hmm. like to make the game, like the randomness of the game, feel justified, there has to be this huge item pool. Um, so to to allow for different experiences without having to design unique rooms for each item. That's why you get things like Arachnomorph and Slide both help you go under passageways. Uh, the Flamethrower and Firebolt both exist so that you can have that variation in your run without having to design like unique rooms for like, uh, here's a fire weapon, here's an acid weapon, here's an electric weapon, here's a, like, too many traversal options. Like it lets you reuse the same obstacles and just have a different way to get around them, I think. And I, I like that fact quite a bit. Um, you know, uh, one one of the things that I appreciate is that, you know, as you as you start a run, you'll run into one or two obstacles, and you'll know that you're getting something in that wheelhouse, but you don't know if you're getting, you know, a, a bolt modification or an energy weapon or how what it's going to toss you to allow you past that. Yeah, and that, I, I love that reason. fact. That it I didn't kind want of keep to like, know exactly what you were getting just because you saw a door that had white flesh on it or whatever. Right, that that feels like a, an absolutely clever way to, to kind of keep the uh, keep the spark alive, keep the interest. Yeah. So. Did you ever have any um, like new ideas for weapons that didn't make the game or anything? Oh man. There's a there's a Google Doc uh, full of them, like, and then and then now that there's a Discord for the game now, and I get suggestions constantly. So like, there are tons and tons of stuff that are not in the game that may someday end up there. Um, I could uh, like um, a big one was I want like a, a weapon that'll toggle platforms, like some kind of um, not an ice beam, but like a there are invisible or kind of faded out platforms and you're able to shoot them or otherwise interact with them that make them solid and that'd be a whole traversal thing. Um, 
like a napalm gun, things that combine mechanics that are already there, a lot of that'll show up. And then like since the game come, came out, I've added like 40 or so items and a lot of that was stuff that just got scrapped for launch that came back in later. Okay. Like the, the boomerang thing. Right. Thing. Would you, you uh, I would say you mentioned, you know, toggling platforms and uh, the the thing that comes to mind immediately is the uh, the address gun from uh, Action Perch. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was about to ask. So that would be the that would definitely be the, the inspiration for that, probably. Right. So um, I'm gonna say we've hit probably somewhere about the 45 mark on the recording. So uh, I, I'd like to take the opportunity to give everybody a breather, and uh, we'll be back in uh, just a couple minutes, right after we break. And we're back. So we're uh, we're gonna uh, re jump into our. Uh, fantastic interview with our delightful uh, guest Matt Bittner from uh, a robot name fight um, I want to uh, I want to toss one out here um, this came by way of uh, one of our other OG founders uh, of the show Adrian um, had a couple he wanted to drop at you here wanted to know and I'm curious about this too actually uh, where did the inspiration for the name come from okay uh, the, the back, the name, actually, I, I get a lot of shit for the name. Like, if, if there's <laughs> You shouldn't, it's fucking awesome. <laughs> if there's criticism of the game, it's like, uh, the controls are sluggish or whatever, because they feel like old school Metroid controls. And then, this name is stupid. The that's name not a comes criticism, from, that's a compliment, damn it. Yeah. So the name comes from, uh, Zach Parsons, who, uh, worked with, like, something, something awful or whatever. Like, forever mm. had a book called My Tank is Fight. Right, and it was all about uh, ridiculous, like oversized tanks from World War II, like just ridiculous machines or whatever. And I put out the Flash game, My Robot Is Fight, which was very inspired by that name. And then that just kind of gradually morphed into a robot named Fight. Like I thought it sounded kind of like spaghetti westernish, or it had this like it didn't it didn't quite sound. Um, I don't know. It didn't sound like an American name. Like it sounded like it went through a translator a couple times, and I liked that like <laughs> distance that it put between. I don't know players and whoever's reading it. I guess. So. Right on. Um, the concept of fight—that's a big thing. Like, yeah. So the other one, and I'm I'm curious about this myself, and I don't know how much of it you can or can't, but on the off chance you can, I'm curious. And Adrian's inquiring too, uh, as a, uh, a developer himself. Um, what's what's the process like to to get up on Nintendo? I mean, Steam is kind of a uh, a free yeah, for all these days, but you drop, you get on Steam. right? But you know, obviously, you know, getting onto a, a console platform is you know something of a different ball game. And uh, I, from everything that I've read and heard. You know, Nintendo especially is all kinds of hoops to jump through to land yourself on that platform. It can be like it's it's weird because like uh, once a publisher has published something on Nintendo, they can pretty much continue to publish things. So that's okay. how you get some games on Nintendo that like I don't want to call anybody's game trash, but you know, like not every game is as good as every other game. And you see some games right. on the store that you're like, yeah. A girl um, named Room, or that uh, witch. Oh, God. <laughs> <Room. Okay. laughs> yeah. I disavow any. But, uh, so, like, yeah, I think it's hard for solo developers, like, if you don't have, like, the right tax IDs and the, the whole, like, a, a company set up and a whole uh, infrastructure or proof, proof that you've published games on platforms before, Switch isn't particularly interested. Like, it has to be a game that has a lot of buzz or something like that around it. I was able to get on Switch because I uh, managed to strike a deal up with my former employer, HitSense. So, so you'll notice whenever you start the game up on Switch, it says published by HitSense. And they're, they've kind of started this little net where they uh, publish a lot of cool indie games. They just put out one called Ministry of Defense that honestly is really cool. It feels like Prince of Persia, 
Um, there's one called Level 99 Axe God that's kind of a beat em up. It's kind of like Golden Knight style. So they were able to help me get on the platform because they kind of had the like business infrastructure to seem legitimate, legitimate to Nintendo where they knew that they weren't like taking a risk or giving their dev kit to some guy in his house, which I am some guy in my house, as you can tell. So, are you some uh, kind of? Are you kind of surprised on how indies have grown or switched to the point where now people want physical? Like, the physical indies are more popular and wanted over triple A in some of the first party games. Are you yeah. surprised? To, are you surprised to see that shift? Well, the move. To, um, I am kind of surprised by the move towards like wanting physical games. Because I like, I made that like separation a long time ago when I switched like switched over to Steam and started playing everything download only. Like I can't remember the last time I bought a physical game. So I'm like a person in that camp. But it, I, I think it's cool that people have um, moved in that direction. Like I don't know. There is something nice about holding it in your hand and seeing all that. Because and, yeah, because of uh, like me and Larry, like we talk about uh, limited run games. Like they just, even Nicholas, like they shot up doing indie games and Fisco. And by the time you actually try to get a copy, all of it sold out. So whether it's collectible or not, um, people want them. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. Have you considered doing like a limited run? Yeah, I have. Um, I'd love to get in contact with limited run games if, uh, you are on Twitter and want to bother the <laughs> out Don't say that I said do that. Um, but, um, no, I've looked into doing physical copies of the game. Uh, we're exploring a handful of things right now. I'm not sure like if anything will come of it. Um, I, there's, like, nothing official at all. But I, Yeah, because I, I think people double dip on Switch. Like, they'll, they'll purchase it digitally, but they will, they will buy it physical. I did. I did that with Fire Emblem. I bought the collector's edition of Fire Emblem. I'm waiting for it to come in, but I bought it digitally so I could have it right now. <laughs> like... <laughs> oh, I've I've double dipped on it's double, triple, and quadruple dipped on countless games, just because I I wanted it when it came. Hollow then, you know, so, Hollow Knight was a, yep. a quad dip, um, you know, but just because it came out digital and there was no word up front that there was going to be a physical and then later on down the line you know physical cropped up by way of lrg or anything like that I'm like yep that's going on the shelf grab me one of those well and, and Matt, I, I want to ask how would you design the instruction book if you was going to do a physical <laughs> oh, version? Man. I, uh, it would be it would be really cool if uh uh I was able to do like an old school, like you, you saw how Binding of Isaac when they released their physical copy or whatever. Yep. Yes. Yeah. I just I don't know what would be feasible, like because I'd have to I'd have to pay some designer. I'm not much of a hand drawn artist person myself, so. Um, but I would I would like to have that old feel of like here's five or six enemies and a little blurb on each of them, and like here's a dumb like kind of obvious hint. Here's like a black and white sketch drawing of this or that. Like that would be really cool. I always like the the old instruction booklets. I used to, uh, honestly, I, I think this might have been illegal. I don't know that it matters. Statue of limitations run up. I'd rent them from game stores or whatever, and then I'd like photocopy the instructions. Yeah, so yep. that, I could yeah. like, <laughs> just enjoy reading them. I guess. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. My favorite thing about the, I mean, that's at least thirty percent of the reason I don't buy physical games anymore is because they don't come with instructions. They don't books. come with anything. That it's just a disc, or in my greatest rage I've ever felt in my life, Halo uh, 5 Collector's Edition uh -huh. <laughs> came with a digital fucking code. Like, it was in a oh, wow. sealed book, Yeah, you opened it up, and it was a digital code. It was That's the same game. as uh, Wolfenstein Youngbloods now for Switch. Dude, there is nothing more infuriating than opening up like this perfect steel book like getting all your like lore and all this stuff that comes with it and opening it and it's a digital download you're just like that flip a paper oh man yeah that's infuriating so i don't really buy physical anymore it, except for if it's like a collector's edition 
or a limited run games or something like that because they always throw in these nice little things that make it worth to me having a physical copy of something. I, I, like, I still buy physical because I like the look of my library. I love just like looking at it and carrying the boxes of so kind of that old school. Um, I still do, I do do some digital stuff, but I'm just like when limited run did I kind of class physical. I had to snatch it up quickly because it was just like that was my game of the year when it came out after I played on PlayStation. Oh and yeah, to now have this Nintendo box is great. <laughs> but to, but to have that game on as physical, it's just like this means more to me because I know that no one else is going to get a chance to get this because it's only limited. Like, so it's something kind of special to me when it comes to physical. Hey, can I pull you guys for a hot take? Can I yeah. Sure. Sure. Okay, what do you all think of Google Stadia? No. I I don't... No. no. Okay. No. Hard. I think the idea had potential, but when the details came out, it started falling apart. Mm. Okay, what are the specific details? I think the I think one that you're not talking about because I'm actually I'm, I'll go ahead and spill the beans. I actually really okay. Like so the Ubisoft thing, the, uh, um, with their plus thing, like you have to have that in order. I, I'm assuming you have to have that with Stadia, uh, in order to play that to play their game. So that's fifteen dollars on top of the ten dollars of Stadia or whatever you're playing to do all of that things. Um, it's, it's going to be weird on how all these companies are going to be putting their games on Stadia and if you have to subscribe to each of them to stream their games. Well, I think so. from what I understand, like, you don't you don't have to pay for the service. Like, you can pay to get the service in a good way. Like, I do think they're, like, trying to upsell you on some monthly charge of, like, yeah. subscribe and you can, Oh, yeah. My you biggest can issue. Or whatever, but you can still, like, but they are going to charge for games and, uh, yeah, the service but, itself is really but, interesting. My the, the, biggest issue with it is that they're charging full price for games. Like it's a full sixty dollars for games that not like you don't own it. Like you don't yeah. own the game. Like right. it's it's in Google's library. You're essentially paying to rent it, and you have to pay the full price of the game. Now, if they wanted to, like, make all the $60 games $30 games and I have to pay for the subscription, okay, I'm more mm-hmm. in line with that. But I'm not so paying $60 to not own my content. I think so, like, you're streaming it, but you don't own the data. Right. right. Yeah. Exactly. I, like, Stadia had an opportunity to be a great middle ground between, like, Xbox Game Pass and PS owning now. a game. You know, it, it had a great opportunity to break down, you know, a a cost barrier to entry to getting people to come play these games. Mm-hmm. I can see that. If the games are cheaper, that would be nice. Like, I, it'd be hard to argue against that. The thing yeah. that really, like, that turned me on to it or that, that I'm still kind of holding out hope for it is, like, I love the idea of not being limited by hardware. Like, right. that's the thing to me. The but there's stuff out there that already them. does that. Like, there's Shadow Play. Um, oh, so there are, there's already some streaming services that are... Yeah, there's like... Uh, oh, man. There's this streaming service out there right now. Um, and it's this company. I'm trying to remember the name of the company. But basically, it's a warehouse full of, like, 2080 TIs and, like, low latency servers that basically make it so where like say like we my roommate uses it because he's got a lower end pc but he pays for it it's 15 dollars a month and he's able to play games on ultra settings because you know he's he's, streaming it yeah right Right. exactly you know so the, the thing the thing i think with google uh google stadia is that i don't think they have a strong launch um, no, everybody's no. going to be looking at this beta on how it plays out and if people have already made a decision to get the AAA games on other consoles and platforms why would you need to play just to stream just to show it off people already can stream these games on Twitch or Mixer or whatever service that they want to use so it really it, it doesn't make sense to have that platform unless they're really going to come with something um, that's going to be different, unique that you can't get nowhere else. Because the only thing that you that you can maybe not get is their first party stuff at the moment. Everything else you can play. People been playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey. 
Mm-hmm. And they paid full price for it. Is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. You know, I feel like all the appeal of it is not like as a consumer because I really don't. I haven't looked at it that much. But as a developer, it seems really neat. Like being right. able I to see not have good... to write that code because it's just co-op. Like it's just input being sent, and like yeah. it mm-hmm. speeds up all these things. So the concept of game streaming, I think, is maybe more exciting than Google Stadia, but. Right, and the and the thing about it is, what games are people going to stream that is going to be different than what you're watching right now? Like, if you're streaming, if you're streaming and watching Fortnite, no disrespect to Fortnite, anything. Like, you could people have been doing that for other platforms, even even with Assassin's Creed and Destiny Two with Shadowlands and stuff. When that comes out, um. It's, it's people has been streaming that stuff and showing it off for everything and talking to different players and stuff. So what is it going? They're going to bring that's like completely exclusive, exclusive to Google Stadia that no one else could stream before. You know, it, it's just it's just seems weird. And then like not having no internet now, you really can't play the game and stuff. People who live in the sticks or the backwoods and yeah, their internet cool. stuff, like what is what is Google going to be charging or even the internet services? What are they going to be charging uh, you to actually run Google Stadia and everything? Like the, I think there's going to be a lot of cost factor into everything with Stadia. And I, I could see Remains them, to- I could see them somewhere down the line, um, eventually or almost inevitably dropping that free tier so oh where they where they like they make you pay uh-huh. see, that, I but that's what I, that, I don't that's, think that'll happen that, but see and that's games. what I that's what I, I thought I thought it was subscription based of nine ninety nine. It's the base price that you start with like you have to pay that like what is it that you're getting for free for that just to buy the games buy and be able to stream them at Moderately, yeah, 30 okay setting. If you want yeah. 4K or whatever, you had to pay. Yeah, if you want 4K, I think you have to pay the extra. But like, if you, yeah. you know, like, I don't run my game at 4K. No, I don't. You know. To play Doom at top top settings, like, well, not top settings, but better yeah. than looks on my computer. So know. stuff that people are doing. <laughs> so stuff that people. It. Stuff people are already doing with their PC of it's up to streaming, like on Twitch or Mixer or something. They're already doing it. They have to pay for it when it comes to Google Stadia. Well, they don't have to pay any extra. They just buy the game on Stadia. They don't get any data. Right. Um, but they, they're able to stream it at any time. They've got an internet connection. You know, if you're able to yeah. play it on your TV or hypothetically on your phone, you know, that's a weird thing. Yeah, I like it's it as like a supplemental thing. Like if I'm, if I'm at a hotel or something, mm-hmm. I don't have to, I don't have to lug my whole system with me. I can just, you know, plug in my iPad and play it or whatever. That's I like it like that. I like it like that. But is that it is this thing that like you can play wherever. Like you don't have to have right. you. Well, you can play on top settings wherever. Like you can right. play, like low end devices can hypothetically play really high end games. It's, 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 it's just contingent on your connection. Yeah. 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 I really hope they just don't have no server problems. Like you playing uh, it in the server jack up and be like, yeah, I can't play this. Oh crap. <laughs> Right, and that's that's another piece that's kind of a turnoff. It's like, oh, our servers are down. That thing that you you know paid uh, you know sixty bucks for, um, you're you're not gonna play that right now because we can't get our shit together because somebody I, broke our stuff. I'm, I'm, I guess with Steam you deal with that some. Like you yeah. can play offline mode, but still, yeah. kind of a rigor. Yeah. I'm definitely going to be looking at Wire within their magazines and Digital Foundry and people who are going to be covering this stuff to get more information because I think they're going to be like, okay, this is what is uh, with this platform. This is all the information we know. We're delivering it to you guys. So now you make up the decision if you want it or not. Um, I don't think streaming games is the future of video gaming. I oh, think, I think dig- I think I think digital and physical is still going to be um, still going on. Uh, I just don't think that streaming the game it will have it will have some business, but it won't be the forefront on how to uh, get a hold of the game. I should say and get some value and enjoyment of. It. I think still people buying it digitally or physically is still going to be part of the business, and that's going to be. How people are raised on getting games. I think both will continue to be a thing, but I think triple 
Triple A developers will really see this like they'll see the benefits I think of streaming and the, mm-hmm. the fact yeah. that they don't have to develop for multiple hardware specs. Like they don't have to make the game run on a hundred billion different kinds of computers with different settings, mm-hmm. and specs, everything. They can design it for this one server computer that just streams out to everybody. Like that's the stuff that's really like weird and compelling to me because you you could break these barriers of what consumer level hardware can do mm-hmm. really fast. But I don't know that that'll happen. Like I think it might flop and. Yeah. I, I will say for this conversation, for this thing, this is really more focused on PC than it is on console. I feel like PC and console has two separate businesses yeah. um, when it comes to delivering games to the customer or consumer. That, that's true, and I'm like a big PC gamer for the most part, so I've always like I've gotten used to the whole Steam thing. And... Yeah. Oh, that froze. Uh, oh no. no. Cause like with St- I think with Stadia, there I'm is. like, oh, I, I think with, oh. <laughs> I, I think with Stadia, I would love to see some Japanese and European arcade games that we didn't get to play here in America. That never can. Like I would love them. I would love for Konami to put the whole Parodius collection on Stadia, and people stream it and get a touch of, uh, of it. Um, your R type game, um, Larry. I would love for people to like play that stuff. Um, I think there's an arcade market that may fit Stadia that I think a lot of people will be into. I mean, it's working kind of for Switch in a sense, but like Stadia having an arcade, like an actual old school and some new school arcade games, I would love to see. I, I could I could see that. That That's a piece I could definitely get behind. So, um, so, we, we touched on it a little, and I'm kind of curious to hear a little more. Um, is is there thoughts rattling around in your head for what might uh, a robot named Fight Round Two look like? Yes, there's actually there's actually a pretty solid roadmap of like the next few updates that I want to put out. Um, I don't want to like give away too much, but uh, I am working on a new area, uh, kind of on and off amongst other projects, so it may take a little longer to get out than the last one. Um, but it's a, it's a new environment that would be an alt for the factory, um, and it is, I guess I can say, uh, there's probably some spoilers out there, I think I've leaked some things. It's a crystal caves Ooh. kind of situation, like a mining facility looking thing. Um, and you can see more of that on Patreon. I've got a Patreon. I'm going to plug it. Um, oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Robot Day Fight. Um, so that's that's how I support continuing doing development. But like, if you want to see a few little like sneak peeks of it and stuff, it's on there. Um, but then after that, I think the game will kind of veer in a wildly different direction. Like, I have some in-game content that I want to add that mm. kind of breaks the Metroidvania structure a little bit. I don't want to say much more than that, but like, I'm, stuff I'm, I've been kicking around for a while. I'm kind of <laughs> curious at what point do you decide to stop pumping new content into a robot named Fight and finally make a clean break and potentially do a full sequel or is a sequel something, anything you would even want to touch? Mm-hmm. I have not decided that. Uh, that's like yeah, that's a question I ask myself a lot. Where I'm like, well, I want to continue supporting this thing, and there's always this, there's already this great foundation in there, but there's stuff right. that I not do the same. Um, I think if I could ever gain the financial grounding to like hire a team and work with other people, that's mm-hmm. when I'd make that clean break and work uh, on a sequel. But as long Adrian, as Adrian, if you hear that, uh, which there, you... there sounds like a job opportunity. <laughs> uh, with, with this, with uh, I hope this... Adrian doesn't like getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he's getting paid right, much now already, not, so right. it might not be a big difference. Would the sequel be a follow-up to the game after the, after the game's ending? Would it be like a new clean slate, like a follow-up, or would you? 
continue like a story within that time frame. Kind of almost like how Resident Two, Resident Evil Two and Three is. Like they're both running at the same time, but Resident oh, Evil considered. Um, I don't think I'd ever do anything that happened. Well, actually, that's that's a complete lie. Um, I would do that, and I am in the process of doing that. I forgot. Um, <laughs> I am I am working on a project that's kind of like a parallel story. Like it it takes place in that same world and kind of at the same time, but it doesn't. Okay. It doesn't really intersect at any point. Um, right. Just so it would be cool. Like I really loved in Shovel Knight with the Plague Knight campaign or whatever, where there, there was yeah. cool moments. Like that was mm -hmm. always really neat. So oh, oh. I'm definitely open to stuff like that. Quick question: Had you heard of a game called Giga Rec X? Yes. Giga Rec X. Yeah, I think it's by Game Freak. Um, Check it out on Switch, because it almost looks something similar to your game, but I don't know if it's Metroidvania in, uh, in a style. Um, it was a game that came out like last month, like like last month or in in uh, May, I think it came out. Um, uh -huh. I'll check it yeah, out. It, yeah, it's from the people uh, with Game Freak. They made Timbo the Badass Elephant. They made that game, so they're yeah. making this one. And of course, some people know Pokemon. Um, they made. That's my. Are shit. they making the the new Pokemon? The yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. I I haven't kept up with Pokemon. I should. I've never played a Pokemon game other than what? the first game. Yeah, yeah. It's weird. I, uh, I, Bro, I I got some games I can I can let you borrow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, I need to go play like Red Blue, and, like learn my history, but it's one big gap. I love Pokemon. That's uh, that's that's my jam. It's Pokemon. Right on. So I, uh, I'm curious. This is one that you you touched on earlier on a, a similar subject, and I'm kind of curious because again, this this excites me, and it's a thing that I love dearly. You talked about uh, maybe looking into doing something pinball-y. Um, I'm I'm curious what a what a Matt Bittner pinball game looks like. Um, head, at least it. I'm a some devil. I'm a some uh, devil crush. Devil crush rules. I've been listening to uh, while well, I've been working on this pinball thing. I've been listening to the soundtracks to Alien Crush and the soundtracks to Devil Crush, like on repeat the whole time I'm working on them. Um, the whole thing um, with this pinball game it came about because I was over at uh, my friend Andrew's house and we were playing Pinball Quest. Uh, on NES, do you know Pinball Quest on NES? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. like an RPG pinball yeah. game. Yeah. So it's it's more of a like exploratory that kind of thing. Um, okay. It revolves around the co-op player and a robot named Fight. With those hands, you can probably piece together kind of what's going on. But uh, yeah, yeah, I've got some ideas. I had to kind of course correct or whatever because uh, have you heard of a game called Yoku's Island? I yeah. was just going to say, yeah. I would be stunned if you have not played it, considering. I hadn't, and then I did. <gasps> like, oh, that's a lot of the ideas I was cooking up, so this will have to veer wildly. Again, this this may never come out. It may not be a thing that I finish, but um, if I do, it, it is in that vein of, like, exploratory pinball. Mm -hmm. um, Yoga Island Express is really, really good. What is it? I guess. Yoga Yoga Island Express. Right on. Pretty good. I would say the the only other one that I pinball game out there that I think kind of touches the level of insanity that I, I what to say. <laughs> uh huh. There, there's only one. It, it's the most LSD fueled pinball game I've ever laid eyes on. Was uh, Flipnik on PS2. I've never played that, but it sounds good. It is. I, I I I fell in love with it because most every other pinball game doesn't really deviate from the fact that it's like, we're gonna make a pinball table and just put it on a screen versus Flipnik says, oh, fuck that, this is a video game, we can do whatever the hell we want. Yeah, the yeah, I've been, watching a, I've been watching a lot of stuff that bends the rules of pinball, uh, I forget the name of the game, but there's like an arachnoid or breakout clone or whatever, but it's like a auto-scrolling breakout did she try? Did she look up uh, Odama, that pinball game that came on the oh, GameCube? Oh God, yes. That's that's uh, another weird one. Voice-controlled pinball warfare in oh, wow. Japan. 
<laughs> yep. Good. Yeah. Good. Weird. It's so. Sonic's Sonic Spinball. But... Sonic Spinball, I definitely played a lot of, so. Mm -hmm. But yeah. yeah um... Thing goes. Oh, actually, did you ever see? Have you ever seen the Pac Man pinball game? I haven't. What's yeah, okay. Pac Man pinball game. So there's, <laughs> a, uh, there's, a, there's, a <laughs> <laughs> there's a combination of Pac Man that you actually play Pac Man, and when you get to a bonus, he rolls down to the bottom, and then you actually play Pac Man in pinball form. Weird. So you like you switch from Pac Man to pinball? You switch from the arcade oh. to the pinball game and back. Right on. That's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, I I found I seen that at a pinball ex, uh, expo, and I was just like, "What is this crazy game? And why do I love it?" <laughs> like, I wanted to roll the game out of the out of the conference for my own. <laughs> right on. Have you all ever seen Hyperball? Yeah. Uh -uh. Mm. Hyperball rules. I was at an arcade expo, right? And what it is is you've got these two like gun control turret things, right? It's not even really pinball, but it just shoots pinballs like rapid fire at all the different targets, and you have to, like, hit them as lightning's coming at you or whatever. It's like an actual physical table, but it's really great. Look that sounds fucking videos. awesome, and I want to play this Hot. now. But yeah, it was the most fun, not pinball, pinball game I've played. <laughs> so. <sighs> so... Limitations be damned. I mean, sure. if, if anything and everything was at your disposal... What what would the the dream creation look like for you? Oh man, that's a heavy question. It probably depends on the day, but uh, I am really interested in a handful of fields. Uh, procedural generation is one of them. I'd like to see a game that has a very handcrafted feel as far as like plot and like important moments and like cinem. Uh, like cinematic moments, that's the word I'm looking for. Things like right. that is procedural gener uh, procedurally generated. Um, and I think like, I don't know, I'm looking into random technologies. Machine learning is really interesting to me. Um, things that are starting to be able to be done with that. So in the future, I'd like a game that, that would have the feel of a AAA production, but was all generated on the fly. Like that would be, that would be interesting. Um, something okay. like a randomly generated Metroid Prime game with moments and cutscenes and stuff like that. Like, how, right. how, how nitty gritty can you get with like making intelligent decisions about camera direction and things like that mm -hmm. through procedural generation? Okay. Um, Pretty big, but that's the, the gist. No, that's what, okay. What is, your, what is your favorite snack when you create or just like your snack time like what is what is that snack <laughs> i always ask this every interview okay no what you have breakfast cereal you pick well snack breakfast cereal oh yeah that is right <laughs> <laughs> and to be fair it's been about two years yeah, yeah probably probably like black coffee yes <laughs> that's that's what it's about that's what i black drink coffee. yeah and then peanut butter sandwiches no jelly that's weird but then, no. you know, that's the best pop tarts Add some honey to it, man. Add some honey uh, to the peanut butter sandwich. Maybe. I like the dry um, gumminess peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, umami or whatever it is. Set um, it up. Set up the honey, dude. It, it's a game changer. We had, we had been having discussions of Pop-Tarts. Uh, is that I in your wheelhouse? Pop-Tarts? I don't have any Pop-Tarts in my home. Oh, wow. I haven't had Pop-Tarts in a very long time. <laughs> I don't dislike them. I just don't. I've done it. Well, do you have a favorite breakfast cereal? As uh, Larry mentioned. No, no. Really? Got my fucking mouth shut about that. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I like to ask one odd uh, questions that you know that really don't make you think sometimes. So, um, real quick, I'm gonna drop this in because. Uh, we, we've dropped a few of these into the uh, Twitch chat, but I want uh, an opportunity for those that uh, aren't catching us on Twitch that are catching the uh, the rerun later, be it on YouTube or on audio, to have a, a crack at uh, some of this, too. Um, 
we've been doling out some uh, very uh, generously donated Steam keys for a robot named Fight in the uh, Twitch chat. And uh, so I'm going to toss uh, one of these out here. Um, for those that are uh, listening, it's, you know, first come, first serve. If you're the first one to grab it, you've got yourself a free game. Uh, we're going to throw out R3YP6Z9HZJHYKKJ. There's a free copy for the first person that grabs that and sticks it in their, uh, their Steam library for you. Merry Christmas. Say thank you to Matt. So You're welcome. Um, but I, I'm curious what your cutting room floor looks like. What What are some of the the ideas and games that you've toyed around with, you know, designing that just never fully formed or came to fruition? Oh, um, if you want to look online, there's a handful of Flash games. I worked on one called Trials of Droids uh, with a friend of mine um, that was kind of like a co-op well, it wasn't even co-op. You switch between these two robots and it was a puzzle platformer. Um, there are a handful of like RPG-style projects, uh, like stuff that would kind of lend it like a Diablo clone-ish type games. Um, and then and then with a robot named Fight, like a lot of different ideas as far as map generation. Like it started out with, uh, like back in Flash days, 10 years ago or whatever, when I was going to work with it. Um, having like a, a skill trees and like a XP mechanic and stuff like that. So, um, I'm curious, given that there, there's, uh, it almost feels like there's some base components that could be made available. Um, have you considered somewhere down the line as either? you know, uh, an update or maybe something to include in, you know, in a sequel to make it really stand apart from the first, um, a, a mode where, you know, the player can actually go in and kind of take some of the baseline pieces and arrange it together in their own layout. I've gotten asked about workshop content a bunch. Um, I'd really love to be able to give those tools, like a tile map editor or something like that, mm -hmm. um, to where people can maybe create their own rooms for the game and have those show up in their runs, or create their own layouts. Like the, That would probably be the easiest thing to do if I were to approach it, would be let people take those pre-existing rooms and arrange them how they like to kind of craft their own Metroid map. Stuff like that would be really interesting. It's just kind of tricky to pull off and then like have the like the tools can be there but then to have tools where people can share that and make it meaningful and then like get feedback on it and like kind of create a community around it that would be the challenge i think so because i mean you know obviously the 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 market's there for it you know mario maker one and two have both done exceedingly well you know you you have i, I think you probably more than anybody probably have the the most groundwork laid to be able to get in to do a maker game in a genre outside of Mario or well, <laughs> I suppose RPG makers, you know, got yeah. there too, you know, years ago, but it's, it's something that, you know, has been talked about. Like we've got Mario maker. What's Nintendo's next maker series you know, it, it kind of feels like you're in a unique position to beat them to the punch at their own game. <laughs> uh, that'd be cool, but I don't know. That's a lot of work. <laughs> like a maker game, it's it's crazy. Like you have to think about the interactions between so many different elements and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. well, I, I, I like the idea. <laughs> I, I know back in the earlier days, like super art, like RC program and stuff, you was able to make your own racing tracks, and yeah, stuff like that. So that was kind of like the first level of creation. And things to have, but you're just gonna share with other people around the world. Well, I got yeah. started like I got started in game development, like um, playing Doom and Quake, and like making maps and stuff for that. I mean, none of them were ever anything other than I played them on my own, maybe post them on a website or whatever. But like modding is really important. I think like, it lets people learn how to make games. So. Right. I to start branching in that direction. It just 
solo dev team person. Like, <laughs> working on too many things all at once. <laughs> I think I think one of the a great one will also be like the Sim City games, roller coaster tycoon and stuff. Cause just to get an idea on how you want to learn how to do layout and stuff, in case you don't you don't want to draw or anything, like doing layout and stuff. I think that's a good idea for people who want to help create games and stuff like that. Oh yeah, just like early games like Sim City, it's where you you kind of use tools and build stuff. Yeah. I like that there's more and more of these like met- like there's programming games now. I think that's really cool. Yeah. Like, is you and games where you like explore logic and you, you get this like physical or visual interface to do stuff like that that's really awesome so um anything uh anything special you want to plug i, th- I think we're kind of coming to a natural close yeah, yeah. here Getting there too. <laughs> um i think uh the game uh, it's available on Switch and Steam right now for twelve ninety nine. It goes on sale a lot. I'm not saying don't buy it now. If you, if you like me, please do. But otherwise, it will be on sale later. And then um, I've got it's a page twelve ninety nine. You get a ton of game. Like it is. I, I it. think it's worth the the the, the uh, entry price of admission. Twelve ninety nine. I've heard multiple people have said, yeah, you could charge twenty bucks for this, but I don't know. Solidly. Uh, uh, and then uh, Patreon. I've got a Patreon where I've been trying to raise money for the continued development of a robot named Fight. Uh, it's patreon.com slash a robot named Fight. If you don't like Patreon for any reason, I've also got like a coffee set up, uh, KOFI. That's another service. So um, I take a lot of donations to continue making games. From one guy in his house. But uh, yeah, and then follow a robot named Fight on Twitter at robot named Fight couldn't have the full thing, so we made the ad symbol, yay. Um, I think that's all my plugs, yeah. I really appreciate you guys having me on. We appreciate just, you having me. Can I we had an absolute just, ball. Oh, can I ask you just yeah. one last question? This is gonna sound weird. Um, uh, the mystical ninja that you gave from Konami, um, would you ever des- uh, design a game like that? Or have you ever thought about using other graphic styles in designing games? Mystical ninja? I don't know it. Hang on real quick. I'll, I'll answer your question by looking you up. Okay. I'm, you're you're I'm, talking just in terms of like deviation and like art style, correct, Eddie? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But also actually doing like mystical ninja because that's kind of, it's not randomly generated, but the way that you move around in that world and fight. Oh, uh, so yeah, like the uh, like pseudo like 2.5D. Yeah. Uh, um, I've thought about it. Um, I don't know. It, like for a beat em up, of course, you'd do something like that, but it, it would just. No, oh, we're frozen again. Oh no! We'll give it a second. He came back pretty quick this, the first time. Last time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm this <laughs> Eddie just wants more Goemon in his life. I need it. <laughs> I think it was fun. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> oh. That and Elliot Syndrome. I don't know why I'm okay that <laughs> Look, I'm an old person. I can't help but play with the gangs. I love you, Kathy. <laughs> I just got Dave, hey, <laughs> you're old. <laughs> I just look, I just got that look. You, I'm I was going to say, don't you complain about nope. being old uh, over there, Eddie. I Sorry, about that. Audio there, is. there it is. All right. <laughs> just yeah. we, we lost you for a minute as you were uh, just jumping into that answer. Yeah, I just said, uh, maybe. <laughs> Depends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was just saying that I love Mystical Ninja and I want to play it and that in uh, Elliot Syndrome. Again, that segment <laughs> eight. Rocks. I like Alien Syndrome. Small mega master system games. Yeah, I could not beat that game at all, and I don't know why. It's cool. So, oh, yeah. um, real quick before we sign off, uh, you know, your uh, re- the the reward for making it to the end of uh, our show for those still listening, uh, we're, I want to drop uh, the the last Steam key uh, on the recording here instead of the Twitch chat. Uh, and it's you know it's a uh, first come first serve. So you know if you're uh, if you're tuning in and grabbing our show uh, as we upload it immediately, here's a uh, 
here's your chance for uh, freebies. Um, last one. T five W L zero Z L I I four K M H X G is your free copy of a robot named Fight. Go enjoy the hell out of that shit because it's awesome. <laughs> It is. Well, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank no you so thank much. You. I mean, again, you know, always, always welcome. Would love to have you back. You know, um, as uh, as things uh, in the future develop, and maybe there's new exciting things to uh, talk about. We we'd love to have you have you back again to do just that. So, absolutely. I'll keep you updated on that pinball game. Oh, yeah. yes. yes. <laughs> All right, bye, everybody. All right, good night. Good night. And everybody, that's all we have for you guys for uh, World War One Podcast, and we will see you next time. Bye, everybody. Peace.